Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guests are Canadian artist Wendy Deschen and American artist Jeff Schmookey, and they will discuss plant bot genetics and the moth project at St. Norbert College. Wendy and Jeff, welcome to the program. Thank you. So let's start off with plant bot genetics. What is that? Well, Jeff and I started working in 2009 and we realized that there were a lot of environmental issues that weren't getting discussed and we were uh, outside of a research lab that Monsanto had in Galesburg, Illinois and nobody knew what genetic modification was so we decided to take uh, uh, some GMO corn that we were growing from the Monsanto Corporation and it looked like it could walk around and we decided to put it on a, a robotic substrate so we could drive it around the town and that was our very first plant bot and it became a satire of uh, large agricultural corporations like that. So we became this company that could satirically talk about those issues. And so, you know, I went to the website and there's a stock price and there's, uh, you know, information about the company. I mean, it looks very much like a, like a typical ag, you know, engineering company's uh, uh, website. That's intentional, obviously, right? Yes, we basically uh, present ourselves as an actual biotech corporation. We use advertising. We have that stock ticker, as you mentioned, website presence. We've even uh, had billboards uh, across the nation with our product, several plant bots. It's the next step in food production, essentially. Has anybody, you know, called you on the phone to uh, perhaps uh, plant a field full of your stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but uh, because we work in public uh, space, uh, we often are on the street corner. We do don our lab coats, and there are people who actually think uh, that we are uh, a subsidy of Monsanto, uh, that we closely model ourselves after, and um, sometimes they're, they're very angry uh, or they're very excited to speak with us. But, uh, uh, no phone calls yet, but we are expecting that shortly. Well, I did notice that you have a number of, I'm going to guess, I'll call them characters. I don't know, no. how, to, I don't know how you guys think of them, uh, of your different products. So mm -hmm. talk about some of your different products and, and where they came from. So one of our favorites is from Florida. So we were down in Florida, and we try and make our products assimilate into the landscape that so they don't look odd. You would walk by it, and you wouldn't necessarily see it until it started singing and dancing or moving around. And we had one in a tree in Florida that sang Britney Spears songs. And so it would sing and dance uh, to Britney Spears, and it was in that very lush tropical setting, and you'd hear the cicadas and all the other little critters, and then suddenly, this shrill Britney Spears song would come out of the tree and, it, and the plant would start moving and that one was particularly very funny um, and so we use humor in order to engage the public on dis a more serious discussion on where our food comes from and how it's produced and where it may be going so the funny Britney Spears hit me one more time plant slash robot in a tree people see it and they stop and they're like what is this and then that disarming event allows a, a more uh, easy discussion to transpire, a more authentic discussion. discussion. So. There, were, there was one that was a very dangerous one. <laughs> yeah. I think that might have been my favorite. Attackeratus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the attackeratus is the result of, uh, of course, it escaped our laboratory. And it's a result of increased pesticide use. And this is real. We are creating super weeds and super bugs with increased uh, amounts of these chemicals and pesticides. Their nature will build resistance. So now we have weeds we can't kill and bugs that like the pesticides actually live off it. That's a scary thought. So you push a button and it's uh, this robot plant is in a container, clear container, and it looks like it's being electrified because you push a, a button and a light goes off and it scratches at uh, the edge of the container like it's wanting to escape. You know, when I was looking through that, what I was thinking of was, um, you know, the dystopian movies like RoboCop and, and uh, Starship Troopers, you know, and Paul Verhoeven, I think, is the yeah. person who did that. 
And there's an element of humor with all of that embedded in a very serious, often kind of gory mm -hmm. thing. Is that, I mean, is that sort of where you were hoping it would be somewhere we're in that We're definitely both children of the 70s and yeah. those dystopic uh, science fiction movies. And uh, we like to quote, quote Godzilla and how Godzilla was used as a metaphor for the atomic age and the fears of what would happen were manifest into this monster. And definitely the, our monsters are a little bit more adorable. <laughs> Man, they're not going to take down Tokyo, <laughs> but there's definitely that metaphor in all of our work, and there's definitely we do push aesthetically that kind of science fiction aesthetic whenever we can, uh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, when all of those, you know, Godzilla movies, Mothra was, of course, <laughs> one. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but that whole generation of uh, you know, unleashing the power of the atom was going to mm -hmm. you know, lead to the destruction of humankind. And you know, it, it's kind of the Frankenstein story all over again, right? right. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. you're killed off by your creation. Um, and um, you know, we're toying here with something very serious, you know, the, the food supply. So, so you are very interested and concerned about sustainable agriculture, right? And so we, talk about that. We definitely want people to have to come to their own decisions. So we don't want to go out there on a soapbox and say you must believe this or that. But what we found is that most people hadn't even thought of some of these issues. And how do you introduce the issues in a way that allows people to get intrigued so not only are they excited to go home and Google them, but they're excited to find a solution for their own family. And that really where the humor comes in and where the kind of mythic stories about our plant bots and the doom that they could create comes in. It's to get families excited to go home, press a button, have a laugh, start a conversation with us, and then go home and educate themselves for their own decision on what would be most sustainable and work for their family. We believe that a lot of little small actions in families will lead up to large positive consequences. So if we all just do small little tiny things, we can have large impact. And I like to talk about the water bottle and how there was a time in my life when we didn't even have the water bottle. And then we all started drinking from them and throwing them away. And now we all recycle them. There's blue bins everywhere. Mm -hmm. So as a culture, we are fluid and we can change. Uh, our direction and make more positive changes as we get more educated about something. And one thing we do advocate though is uh, transparency in food production because it is complex and the American public does not agree on much. Uh, we, you know, it's very divisive. However, more than 90% of the American public believes in the proper labeling of food whether or not it contains genetic modification. So they can make informed decisions as a consumer. That's an astronomical amount, more than 90%. So we advocate labeling, uh, which is very easy to do, uh, and yet there's been massive campaigns uh, by the biotechs against it. Why, why do you think that is? I mean, if I mean they, they say that this is perfectly safe and you know this is uh, a way to feed a planet that might have eight, nine, ten billion people on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a sense, they are making the claim that, hey, we're doing good work. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it is that they are so um, opposed to labeling and letting people know what they're doing? Well, they've been saying uh, they feed the world for the past 25 years. We're still waiting for that to happen. It is a business. We, we must not forget it is a business. Uh, so, but why they don't want to? That's a very good question, and I think a lot of the public is asking just that. Why don't? Why can't they just put a word on their their food products? And I think they know deep down that once the public sees that, and then they see an organic or a small farm, locally farm raised or farmed uh, food, they'd rather support their local farmer than a big ag corporation. They want to know, most people want to know what they're eating, but, and there are some people who don't care. And that's okay, at least we have a choice. That's what democracy is about, having a choice. So uh, food labeling or transparency in its production is something we do advocate. And when people come by, we gauge their interest and we provide information to them that they can further research. Again, like Wendy said, we don't 
want to tell people what to think. That's not our job. But as artists, we promote conversations about things that most people might not uh, have. have uh, we, we surprise them with our work, basically, and that, that disruption causes them to become interested. You know, artists have been playing that role in culture probably since the first time somebody put a buffalo on the cave wall, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so when you think about the work that you do and the things that inspire you, who, who do you look to? I mean, and it, it might be in the music world, it might be in the literary world. Who are you looking to uh, as your heroes for well, what art they've and, done? Art and science has been together for centuries. Uh, when you think of da Vinci, he wasn't just painting uh, paintings, he was also you know, creating inventions. It's just recently that art has, has turned itself into its own thing that didn't interact with a lot of other things. And so we're actually going back to a very ancient uh, type of way of thinking about what art can be. It's not a new thing. But there, there's also a couple contemporary artists who do create satirical uh, companies. And uh, I like to think of the Yes Men, and I don't know if everyone knows them, but if you don't, you should look them up. And they go into, they disrupt large businesses by becoming business, uh, business people and, and entering into the conferences and spouting almost ridiculous things to see if they can get a reaction. And what happens is they often don't. And that to them points how, how ridiculous the business world actually is, that you can spout these things and everybody just accepts it as part of it. And one of the things I think our project touches on, because people come up to us and think that our singing, dancing plants are real, is that <laughs> we are in a place in the world where that could be possible. The, that, ludic that ludicrousness that we thought, oh, nobody will think this is real, but we're in this place where we are splitting uh, genetics to a point where we could create this kind of hybrid that people actually can suspend their disbelief and think it's part of the current climate that we live in and that's a really interesting thing so I think we're inspired just by living in this this time where anything could be possible it's also really exciting and another uh, person I think we we you know because we've worked with Rick Lowe who is a MacArthur Genius Award grant uh, grantee, he he basically his socially engaged practice or community based art art it it the actual formation of a community is the art aspect. It's okay if you have some objects or props or sculpture or painting, but it's the formation of the community, the activities of the community working together uh, under the direction of an artist. Uh, and other professionals in a common goal that that community sets forth as being important. So it's the community coming together, that is where the art is happening, and there's, there's a very performative aspect or performance as aspect to that. Well, I want to talk about the moths. Okay. Okay, so, you know, moths are kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the beauty of the beautiful insect world. Why moths? What, well, I mean, there's there's a lot of you know you have beetles, you have butterflies, <laughs> bees. So, uh, we started off with uh, the question of whether genetic modification, what what it is and what it was doing and where it may be going, and then we realized that without pollinating insects, we don't have any crops, we don't have any food. Uh, so we 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 study because we're research we were researchers. We came across numbers of bees that are dying. Our bees are dying very quickly. It's very disconcerting. So, yeah, we could talk about bees, but how are we going to do that? I mean, they sting. They don't like lights. People are they, afraid of them, unfortunately. Uh, so, and people some are people, allergic to them. Yeah, allergic. <laughs> they die uh, that. So, uh, we, with research, we came up with uh, moths, because moths are, there, there are, there is a long list of pollinating insects. Some even mammal, mammals uh, pollinate. Uh, butterflies get all the attention. They do. Uh, moths come out at night, and we were already using light in some of our projects. So a fluorescent light bulb will draw a moth. And if you set the lights out, they come to you. You don't have to get on your hands and knees and trudge through the forest. So light also attracts people. Wendy makes videos of moth wing patterns that are projected on tents to draw people, and we set out lights to draw the insects and they land on the tent and it's all there but moths 
are a second shift or secondary pollinator, and by talking about moths, we talk about the importance of other insects that also pollinate our food. What do you do to, to make the moth life a better life? Well, we advocate that everybody have some pollinator plants in their, in their, their yard because grass, as wonderful as it is and as much as we all love it, actually doesn't feed anything. Um, and it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of resources. So if everybody had a small strip of wildflowers in somewhere in their yard, then bees and moss and other pollinators would have something uh, to eat because they, most of them eat some form of nectar. So we have to provide those kind of plants in our yard. And we advocate that if you also plant some of those plants that are native to your area, not only will you support pollinators, you'll support a lot of the other ecosystems in your, in your area, as well as it's so much easier for you to grow because if it's native it wants to be here it gets the right amount of light it gets cold when it's supposed to get cold and um, it's very little work for the gardener so that's definitely one action we can take and Jeff, another mm -hmm. action is uh, home-based pesticides 10 times stronger than what is being sprayed in our field and we all know when you see a crop duster or them spraying you don't want to be around there <laughs> Uh, if you have to use home-based pesticides, read the label uh, and don't spray when it's windy because you may, you may be spraying it, weed killer or pesticides around your house, but if there's a breeze, it'll go down the street and kill uh, insects that are, that are pollinating. And, you know, I, I grow tomatoes in my backyard and cucumbers, and I need pollinators to get that, get that fruit. I, li I want that. So uh, one year, a neighbor was spraying, and we lived uh, a couple blocks, and everything died. And I, I, I was asking around, hey, anyone else have this problem? And we narrowed it down to that. Neonicotinoid uh, mm -hmm. are especially dangerous to bees. It's a class of insecticide that the Ninth uh, Federal Court just struck down uh, the EPA approval of just two weeks ago, which is good news because the EPA, they're out there to protect us in the environment, but somehow they approved this insecticide that uh, without due uh, research, without testing, and I'm glad the court struck it down. What neonicotinoids do is disrupt the bee's brain so it can't find its way back to the hive if it even gets that far. The irony of it, I think, is that folks thought these neo uh, Nicanoids? Nicanoids. Nicanoids. Yeah. They, they, uh, they, they thought that this was great because these were natural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, interesting. So, I mean, you know, when you think about the importation of bugs to control other bugs, I mean, I, 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 I do, you know, worry about the Frankenstein aspects of, yeah. uh, of all that stuff. It usually goes poorly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, it works for a while. And it looks great for a while. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, bugs have been around a long time. They figure it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, most people, when they think about moths, they think about pretty bland looking animals, right? And that's not true at all. No, it's not. And I think that we think of them as bland because we see them at our back porch and we see them backlit and we see them flying around and they're just always there and we've taken them for granted for years. And um, when we started the project, the, most people's reaction was, oh, a moth is going to eat my sweater. So there's just so much misinformation about them. A, a very tiny amount of the amount of species in moth will actually eat your sweater. And it's usually not the moth, but the, but the larva. So if you see it flying in your house, it's probably not going to eat your cashmere. <laughs> well, you know, the, the uh, most telltale hallmark of somebody who is over the age of 75 is the, the know, smell is the smell of <laughs> moth balls. Uh, moth ball smell. <laughs> then again, they have some really cool sweaters over there. <laughs> 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 this is true. <laughs> but if you stop and you really look at one in the light, you can start seeing the amazing amount of patterns they have. And they're great mimickers because they are basically the flying hamburgers of the insect world. And they do offer a food supply for many of the birds. Flying hamburgers. And if, if, if they were to go away, many of our songbirds and other 
migrating birds would go away because they would lose a food source. And so they've learned how to mimic, uh, and they're, they go to sleep in the daytime, so they have to hide. And so they have these wonderful mimicry patterns on them. Uh, sometimes the daytime ones, because there are daytimes, so they'll mimic a bumblebee or a hummingbird. But the nighttime ones will sometimes mimic bark, or they'll mimic uh, a flower that they sleep on. And so they can have a range of colors and patterns, and they're extraordinarily beautiful when you stop to look at them. Well, uh, when I was reading about what you do, um, you go lots of different places and you kind of set this up and collect the moths and, and then you catalog them in a sense, right? And when you were here this past summer in Green Bay, you did that and you have a book about this, right? So talk about that process. So we, not, we don't collect them with pins or we kill them, so we use photography to capture them. And then we share the photography in a field guide. And the field guide covers some of the things you can do at home with your family that could directly uh, positively affect the environment, as well as a section that shows the moss that we've collected in, in that area and uh, their scientific name as well as their common name because often for families the science name is much more complicated to remember um, but they can teach their kid oh this is the you know this is the luna moth and that's a name that you you would remember it's like moon and it comes out at night and so we we create that information in the book with a nice picture of the moth and we try and take some of the scientific language out of it and make it uh, more palatable for families, not because the science isn't important, but because it's kind of a gateway book to get you mm -hmm. excited. And if you really like, you know, the 50 moths in our book and you start maybe finding some of those in your backyard, maybe you'll get really into mothing and go and get the more hardcore scientific uh, book on moss and so it's a way to get people excited eh, about what's in their backyard in a in an easy gentle way that is more about just giving them enough information to get started mm -hmm. Environmental problems are widespread and they're not necessarily specific to one area and pollinators are everywhere. If we lose the bee in any country it's going to be devastating. So also, international boundary lines, they're not big walls. I, I know in America we like to talk about that, but most countries don't have that as a concept. And so wildlife and insects, they go back and forth freely. They don't carry little passports. And so it's a, these are issues that every country is going to be affected by. And so we go anywhere and everywhere because it's an issue everywhere and anywhere. And one of the things that we, when we were talking in Amsterdam, that people were most interested in the fact that these neonics could be right inside the plant. So you didn't even have to go spray the plant to put them on there. You would buy a plant and it would come inside it. And you wouldn't know, again, because it wasn't labeled. And so in America, these conversations has led to some places starting to label their plants. Uh, but I've noticed that when they do, they label them very positively. This plant won't get mealybugs. This yeah, plant right. won't get aphids. <laughs> it doesn't say that it will kill any pollinator that lands on it. But <laughs> <laughs> wow. yeah. So it's a little scary. Again, and that goes back to the first issue we were talking about, about labeling. You know, transparency. So we, as a consumer, can make the choice. Do we want the plant that potentially will kill a bee? And if I do buy it, maybe I should keep it indoors. That's my... I. I want to have that choice as a consumer. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about you know your own backgrounds and your uh, you're both academic artists, mm -hmm. which um, is sort of I, I would guess the uh, the highest form of uh, of being an artist, right? Because it's, oh, a, it's a it well, it's a great gig. It's a great it's gig. It's a lot of tree branches in the art tree. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but I mean I, I mean one of the you have a platform and a place and, and all mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So uh, talk about where you grew up and how you wound up. Uh, Okay, well, I'm originally from Arizona and uh, grew up way west of Phoenix, about half an hour, and my dad was a staunch Republican who bought into Jimmy Carter's uh, solar energy uh, help. So I grew up with solar panels on the house, and because it was the desert, we always had rationed <laughs> water, and I, I was brought up to be essentially carefully tread on the planet, you know, because it was limited resources in the desert. So that really influenced me, and I'm now at Georgia Southern, outside Savannah, and I, my background's in ceramics specifically, but today, artists need to be interdisciplinary because the world's an extremely complex place, and it's becoming ever more complex. And I like to create art that 
yes, you can maybe drink out of or eat off of, but I want to create art that also uh, inspires discussion. And you actually got your master's in New York, is that right? Uh, New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. It's, it's a highly regarded school, and uh, it was uh, definitely a, a good experience. I, 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 again, I'm an expert in ceramics and how, it, I mean, you could drop me off on a deserted island and I'd be able to figure out how to do my work still. So. <laughs> And you're from the painting tradition, is that correct? I am. I have my uh, MFA in painting from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. But I grew up in Canada. I'm Canadian, so I did my undergraduate work in Canada. And my family had a off-grid cabin in the woods in the 70s. My dad built it by hand, and it's on a lake. And this is, you know, up here in the north, this is very common for people to have these summer cabins. And Back then, we didn't call them off-grid, or they didn't have any cool titles. They were just, you know, oh, the summer place. And they didn't have running water, and they didn't have electricity. And so I spent my summers as a child with, you know, uh, using an outhouse is just common. <laughs> so it, and it, we didn't have electricity there. So we treaded lightly on the footprint of the forest, as I'm sure many people who have cabin here do. They have a different kind of connection to nature than people uh, maybe who don't have that experience. And uh, But I grew up in a forest every summer, so it was really hard for me not to be connected to that in some way, or to find ways to be connected to that. And painting for me allowed me a place to begin thinking about things, and then I could expand past it. Uh, and now I'm interested in everything, and we love working with scientists and talking to them and collaborating with people outside our field. It's very exciting. Well, that's mm -hmm. the beauty of being part of a college or a university, mm -hmm. is that yeah. you get to get that cross-pollination, if I may mm -hmm. use that expression. <laughs> well, we only have a couple minutes left, but I do want to ask you a question. Because you're both academic artists, you teach, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you get a chance to teach undergraduates? Oh, yes. Yeah, Definitely. So, so what's that like? Because often the ones that wander in are people that are taking it because it's one of their general education requirements, right? That they, they have to take the art appreciation course. How do you draw them in? What do you do to get them excited about that? Well, one of the things that we do in the classroom as well as in our project is create excitement and, and curiosity, we encourage curiosity and we try to make it the learning process experiential. So I know when a student uh, gets on the, the wheel, the potter's wheel for their first time, I mean, they're just going nuts, nothing's working, it's almost like uh, mud is being thrown uh, everywhere and they have no control. But Patrick Swayze through, isn't behind them. Well, uh, you know, that, that, that <laughs> they, they always talk about that. But uh, they, it's the experience and the opportunity and the encouragement that they're given that allows them to move forward. And we do that same thing. We try to make the empirical experiential. So what we do in the classroom easily transfers to the work we do with the public. That, I, I would believe that. I mean, I think teaching is not just something that happens in the classroom. I'm, I'm an economist, you know, right. mm -hmm. and uh, I do sports economics, and there's all kinds of venues for, for teaching, and you do it in the backyard. How about at Auburn? Is the same thing? You yeah, and I look, students? I look for ways that I can get my students engaged with the real world whenever possible, because art is often thought of this thing that lives in this temple, and it's for special people in a special room, and you have to put your art on hat on to go and uh, get engaged with it. And so I look for ways to break that stereotype with my students wherever possible. So we often paint murals with uh, our community, and we go out to the community, we talk to them, we, find, we uh, discuss what they might want to see, and then we come back and we try and translate that, and then we go back into the community with it. And so I look for ways wherever possible to bring it outside of, of the temple of art and, <laughs> and allow them to think of ways that as they go past Auburn, how can they, that continue in their own life? How can art be part of their daily life and not just exist on a wall and somewhere special. It's really important to me that my students learn that. I think that that makes them more excited when they realize it can be part of all aspects of their life as well. Well, you know, a life without art is probably a, not a life worth living. But we'll have to leave it there. But thank you very much for, for being here today. And I hope you've enjoyed this too. Check out uh, their work. Uh, the Plant Bot Genetics uh, website is, uh, is pretty funny and I recommend it. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College. <laughs>